Well, brethren, here we are on the day of Pentecost, and we've already addressed various aspects of it uh, during this day. And I want to uh, go a little further, uh, building on what we've already heard today. I went into the fact yesterday that uh, Pentecost is a day that ties in with the covenants, the Old and the New Covenant, uh, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, as well as the giving of the Holy Spirit that began the process of God making a new covenant uh, in Acts chapter 2. Both of these occurred on the day of Pentecost. Now, if you simply read the account uh, in a summary way there in Exodus, uh, you would not uh, see just right out where it says uh, that the Ten Commandments were given on the day of Pentecost. But uh, I want to sort of set the stage, uh, give you a little bit uh, of information on that, or just show you why. On what basis do we say that? Now, it is a matter of Jewish tradition, uh, but uh, the Scripture preserves the record as well. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1, there is an interesting uh, phrase uh, that is used that a lot of times we read over, and or maybe you've been a little curious sometimes as to what it means. Why, why is it said this way? It says in Exodus 19.1, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone out, gone forth from the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. The same day is what? Now, what, what does that mean? Now, that, that's uh, sort of curious. And, and uh, uh, actually, uh, part of the problem is that when we think of month, we think of it in the way that we have on our Roman calendar. But you know the word that is the origin of the word month is the word moon. The word in the Hebrew language is translated month could just as easily have been translated moon. That's what it means. Uh, because in God's uh, calendar, the uh, it is a solar lunar calendar. It is solar in the sense that it is tied in with the seasons. Uh, it is lunar in the sense that the months uh, began on the new moon. So when we read in the third month, we're reading in the third moon. You see, it was in the first month or the first moon that the Passover occurred. And now we're to the third moon. The moon has gone through, uh, now it is in the third phase. If you went back to Exodus 12, you see, God says, this shall be unto you the beginning of months. This was obviously a new moon, and it was the what became at that point the first moon. Now we are to the third moon, and that's what that phrase the same day means. Uh, it means, it's a Hebrew idiom that refers to the first day of the month. You see, in the third moon, the same day, the, the day that the, the third moon began or the third month began. So it was a, it's a phrase that means the day of the new moon. So here we are on the first day of the third month that they came uh, here unto the wilderness of Sinai. So they arrived at Sinai on the first day of the third month. Then we find in verse 3 that Moses went up unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain and said, You shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. So they arrived on the first day of the month. They got there and they pitched their camp. And now here we are on the second day and Moses goes up the mountain. God calls him up. He spends the day up there with God. God gives him these instructions. And uh, uh, he tells him, he said, You have seen how I brought you out on eagle's wings, brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, so God was preparing to make a covenant. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you're to speak. So Moses spent the second day of the month up in the mountain getting instructions from God, and he came back down. And then in verse 7 we're, we're told that... Uh, Moses came and he called for the elders of the people and he laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And so now we are here at the third day that Moses has a meeting with the people and with the leadership, with the elders, and he lays before them all the things that God had instructed. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So here we are on the third day, Moses talking to the elders and the people at Mount Sinai now on the fourth day, Moses goes back up, takes 
the words of the people unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So, uh, here they are. Uh, they arrived at Mount Sinai on the first of the month. Moses met with God in the mount on the second day of the month. The third day, Moses called the elders and the people together, laid everything out. The fourth day, he returned up to Mount Sinai, gave the God the people's response, came down and announced to the people that they that this was the first day of sanctification. There was a three-day process, and that day, uh, that uh, fourth day of the month was the first day, and the fifth day would have been the fifth day of the month would have been the second day of sanctification, and the third day, when the Lord would come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai and give the Ten Commandments, was the sixth day of the third month, the sixth of seven. Now, the Pharisees, as Mr. McNair alluded to this morning, kept Pentecost on a day of the month. Now, Pentecost always comes in the first week of the third month, but it can vary. It so happens that on that year it came on the sixth day of the third month. The Pharisees, at a later time, always celebrated it on a day of the month. But it not only came on the sixth day of the third month, it also came on a Sunday, as it of course, obviously always does. You see, if you go back to the Passover, you find that in the year of the Exodus, uh, the uh, Passover was celebrated on a, uh, on a Thursday evening. Friday was the, uh, the Passover day, the, the daylight portion of the Passover. And at the first day of unleavened bread, uh, the uh, night to be much observed was on a Friday evening. And that first holy day, the day of unleavened bread, the 15th day of the first month, was on a weekly Sabbath. And uh, therefore, the... Uh, uh, Sunday, that was the day from which the count would be made, would have been the 16th day of the first month, the day after the uh, weekly Sabbath. Uh, that Sunday uh, would have been the 16th, and if you, can't, if you come on down seven weeks, uh, you will find that that will bring you right on down uh, to uh, the sixth day of the third month, exactly uh, seven, exactly seven weeks uh, coming down the count. You, you find that... Uh, uh, the first, when they arrived on the first day of the third month, that was 45 days after the ex, after the beginning of the Exodus. You can go back and count up the days. I won't uh, be tedious and go through them one by one, but uh, uh, it, it was uh, it was 45 days from the from the time of the Exodus. Uh, simple to figure. 15. If if the first day, first holy day, was on a uh, on a Sabbath, that was the 15th day. You had 15 more days left in that month, and then another. Uh, uh, then another 29, and then this brings you for the second month, and then this brings you to the first day of the third month. So you had 45 days there, and if you go through, uh, you uh, categorize through the other five, and we come then to the 50th day, the completion of the seven weeks, and the, we're now at the time of the 50th uh, day, Pentecost, which was the time that you read in Exodus 20 when God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. God had proposed a covenant with Israel and he said, I'm going to make you, if you will accept the terms of my covenant, you will be a holy nation unto me. You will be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. God called Israel for a purpose. The old covenant that had its beginnings on that first day of Pentecost, Israel was called out for a purpose. Now, Pentecost is most commonly called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of First Fruits in the Old Testament. It was the festival that celebrated the first fruits harvest. And it was arrived at by counting seven weeks. And the day after the seventh week was Pentecost or the 50th day. Now, it is, we're here then to celebrate the first fruits harvest. We're here to celebrate the first fruits harvest. God talks about that and uses that terminology. Uh, in Exodus 23, for instance, uh, Israel was told in verse 14, Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You keep the feast of unleavened bread. Uh, verse uh, 15, verse 16, the feast of harvest of first fruits of your labors. And the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year. So we find three festival seasons that are laid out. The one is the uh, feast that is in the, the, the first of these three times in the time appointed of the month of it. 
Now, a bib literally means green ears. It was the, the month during which the first green growth, it was the first month of spring. It was the time when the fresh green growth uh, began to come up. Uh, the, we find that there's a harvest aspect to these three festivals. Notice, and this is laid out in Exodus 23 perhaps more clearly than it is anywhere else. You're to celebrate the festival of the month of green ears. The month of fresh growth. Then you're to celebrate the festival of the harvest of the first fruits of your labors. Then you're to celebrate the third festival season is the festival of ingathering, the great gathering in of the harvest, the culmination of the harvest. So what do we find? We find God has three festival seasons that are pegged to three aspects of the agricultural seasons in ancient Israel. The festival season that was highlighted by fresh new growth, by new beginnings, by fresh starts. The festival that was the celebration of the first fruits harvest, and the third festival season that celebrated the great gathering in, the culmination of the harvest. Now, isn't that what God is doing spiritually? When we began with the first festival season in the spring, in the, in the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread, isn't that a time that is celebrated by the spiritual equivalent of a fresh start, of new growth, of new beginnings? Isn't that what the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread is all about? A time of a fresh start, a time of new growth, a time of a new beginning. Isn't that what we celebrate spiritually? This festival season, we're celebrating the harvest of the first fruits, that God is calling out a first fruits. You know, that's precious knowledge, and we take it for granted sometimes. You know, I can remember growing up that uh, one of the things that my mother would talk about from time to time, because it would bother her when she would think about it, that was the fact that her father had never, quote, joined the church. He had never been baptized. Now, from all accounts, he was uh, what would be termed a good man. He was, uh, he was a good neighbor, and he was a kind man, and he was maybe many things, but he was not someone who went to church. And that used to worry her because, of course, we grew up. She was a Baptist. I grew up in the Baptist church. And, and uh, uh, you know, if you really believe this is the only day of salvation, and you have the ideas that they have, then the nagging doubt is back there. Is he down in hell? Is he spending eternity in hell? Well, you know, she really didn't know. She didn't want to believe that and didn't want to think that. And, and, and she could think of, well, you know, he was a good man and all of this. But then on the other hand, you see, he had never been particularly religious, at least in a uh, in, a, in the formal sense of it, in terms of being involved in a church or a church organization, didn't go to church. And so she didn't know. And I used to worry about that sometimes as, as a child, and I would think about uh, uh, different ones. Uh, I guess he was perhaps the most close of uh, any of my relatives or family members that I knew about, that, because basically all the rest of them were, uh, uh, were in uh, the Baptist church. But that was uh, uh, because I knew she was concerned about it. it. It would bother me sometimes. And as I would get on up older and, and we would hear about different things, and I would think about, well... What about, you know, all the people that never heard of Jesus? What about, you know, I can remember asking my Sunday school teacher, well, what about the Indians that were over here before Columbus ever came? You know, they never even had a chance. What about all the people in Africa and China and India and places where we send missionaries, people that lived and died and never even heard the only name given under heaven whereby men must be saved? You mean all these people are going to hell? They're all burning down there forever? That didn't make sense to me. I didn't have the answer, didn't have the explanation, but it didn't make sense to me that that was the way God was doing it. The idea that was presented was God is desperately trying to get the whole world saved right now. And of course, the devil was desperately trying to get the whole world lost right now. Now, if that's the case, you have to conclude that the devil was coming out, he was winning it hands down. If God and the devil were in a race, I mean that the devil had won it walking away. Any way you wanted to count, he had a whole lot more people with him. Did this represent the best that God could do after 2,000 years uh, since Christ came? Here were, even if you counted everybody that even professed, even claimed to be a Christian, everybody from, you know, 
Unitarian to Pentecostal to Catholic to Baptist to Lutheran to you name it, everybody that even attached the name of Christ to themselves. You still only dealt with a small minority of the world's population. You know, if you think about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But you see, we're in that period right now, the period of God's spiritual harvest. We're celebrating the first fruits harvest. The time of the great ingathering, the time of the great gathering in harvest is yet in the future. That's celebrated in the seventh month. You see, God is engaged in a spiritual harvest just like ancient Israel was engaged in a physical harvest. And the three phases of that physical harvest that were outlined here by festivals focused in on the three aspects of God's spiritual harvest. God is in the process of gathering in the first fruits. We're here to celebrate the first fruits harvest. We find that clearly stated in Exodus 23, back in Leviticus 23. We find the outline of all of the holy days. And we find that the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread was to be celebrated. That's mentioned here in Leviticus 23, uh, beginning on in verse 6. And uh, the uh, uh, coming on down to verse 8. And then we find uh, in verse 9 it talks about the sheep of the first fruits uh, that was to be taken. In verse 11, that was to be on the morrow after the Sabbath. That is the Sabbath, of course, during the days of unleavened bread, as Mr. McNair made reference. And they were then to count... Verse 15, beginning with that day after the Sabbath, or the Sunday during the days of unleavened bread, on which the wave sheep was offered, they were to count seven Sabbaths were to be complete. Verse 15, the morrow after the seventh Sabbath was to be 50 days. And of course, if you go through, take the calendar, you can count the seven Sabbaths, and today is the day after the seventh Sabbath. Yesterday was the seventh Sabbath uh, that has elapsed uh, since then, and we are here on the 50th day. And uh, uh, I just would call your attention to one interesting thing. We don't offer, of course, the offerings, but they were symbolic, the, the offerings in the sense of the sacrificial portion. And the reason is explained in Hebrews that Jesus Christ offered himself as one sacrifice for sin forever. We, the Levitical priesthood is not what functions in our age, in our time. Uh, some, of course, say, well, you know, if... If you're going to celebrate the holy days, well, you've got to offer sacrifices because they offered sacrifices on the holy days. Brethren, they offered sacrifices 365 days a year. They, In fact, they offered sacrifices every morning and every evening. They had the morning and the evening sacrifice. If doing away with the sacrifices does away with the holy days, it just does away with days in general. It does away with every day. Because they offered a sacrifice every morning and every evening. No, the holy days didn't stand or fall on whether or not a sacrifice was offered. Jesus Christ uh, offered one sacrifice for sin forever, uh, we're told. But notice here what they did with this little uh, sheaf, this first fruit sheaf, this omer that was taken. They were to take, in verse 12, the wave sheaf, uh, They offered a lamb for a burnt offering, and then they took the meal offering, verse 13. Meat offering in the King James. Meat is used in the older English sense of of, uh, food, uh, and and, uh, it is a grain offering. It was to be two-tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire. Now, brethren, that was done on the Sunday during the Days of Unleavened Bread. That was an unleavened offering. It consisted of oil and flour. They offered an unleavened offering. That was the first of the first fruits. That was offered on the day of the wave sheaf Sunday. But we come on down seven Sabbaths, and then on the day after the seventh Sabbath, the 50th day, notice what they were to do in verse 16. They were to bring a new meal offering unto the eternal. They were to bring out of their habitation two wave loaves of two-tenth deals, they were to be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the eternal. Now, I want to call your attention here that this is the only of meal offerings that was ever baked with leaven. 
what was offered at the beginning of the first fruits harvest was not leaven. It was made during the days of unleavened bread. It couldn't have been leaven. It was unleavened. But on the day of Pentecost, two loaves were offered, and they were offered with leavening. They represented the culmination. You see what was offered on the first day of the count, on the Sunday, the wave sheaf Sunday during the days of unleavened bread. That represented the, the beginning of the first fruits harvest. That represented the first of the first fruits, the beginning of the first fruits harvest. What was offered on the 50th day was a collection that was taken from grain that had been harvested throughout the 50 days. It was representative of the entire harvest of the first fruits time. And it was offered as two loaves. And they were left. You know who those two loaves are, don't you? Well, we're part of one of them. You see, we're part of, we're the first fruits. If you want to look, there were two phases to the church of God. One was the Old Testament phase, the other was the New Testament phase. Israel was called the first fruits of the nations, and we're the first fruits. We're going to see that here in just a moment. But you see, the first fruits of the people that God has called, there's a little leavening in the lump, isn't there? God's church down through the years has always, has never been totally perfectly unleavened, has it? The, the first fruits harvest is pictured. It represents the church. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament phase, Jesus Christ was the first of the first fruits. He was without any leaven. Notice back in, in James 1.18, to understand a little more, James 1.18, we're told that God, of His own will, begat He us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. That we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. See, God begat us with the word of truth, and we are a first fruits of his creatures. So God has called us as a part of his church today to as a spiritual first fruits. God is, uh, uh, you see, anciently in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3, we read that Israel was holiness unto the eternal and the first fruits of his increase. That was the starting point. That was the beginning of God's harvest of the nations. Israel was holiness to the eternal, the first fruits of his increase. That was the Old Testament church. God of his own will begat he us. God chose you and me. He chose us and he begat us with his spirit, with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits. That's what God has called us to be. God is not trying to save the whole world right now. God has a spiritual harvest that is right on schedule. We're here to celebrate the second phase of that harvest, which is the first fruits harvest in the fall. We will celebrate the culmination of the harvest when God is gathered in all of his harvest. Now, not only do the three festival seasons focus in on the three phases of God's spiritual harvest, they also focus in on three phases of something else. Do you realize, brethren, there are three phases to personal salvation? There are three phases to salvation. The world doesn't understand that. You know, they think that uh, uh, the moment that you, quote, accepted Jesus, why, you've been born again and you're... Uh, you know, you're, you're already in the kingdom and you're saved now and, and all of this. Jesus, of course, said in Matthew 24, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Salvation is a process. And there are three phases to that process. And they are also typified by the three festival seasons. The first phase of salvation is being justified. Justification. That just means to be made innocent. So we start out guilty. And that means we're in trouble. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. 
We've all sinned. We've all come short. So the first stage, if we're going to be saved, is that we have to be brought to a state of being innocent. Sin has to be wiped away. The penalty has to be paid. We have to be forgiven. We have to be moved from the category of guilty to innocent. The first phase of salvation, the process of salvation, involves making taking the guilty and making them innocent. Well, how do you do that? Well, God took care of that because, you see, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ died for us. He took your place and mine. Well, God commends His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are as he said, as we're told here in the book of Romans, we'll just note it. Romans 5:10. If when we were, uh, well, let's let's pick it up in verse uh, verse eight. God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood. So we were justified by the blood of Christ. The Passover season is symbolic of the first that focuses our attention on the first phase of salvation and how it's made possible. We celebrate the Passover season in the early spring, the first of the three festival seasons. We are justified by the blood of Christ. We're made innocent. Being much more now, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Oh, our salvation is yet future. Because the wrath of God is yet future, and we will be saved when the wrath comes and we're saved out of it. We don't have to experience that. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. We were enemies, but we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So, the first phase is being justified, being made innocent, having our sins paid for. Having our account marked paid in full. That's the first phase of of salvation, but that's not all there is. Just being made innocent isn't enough. The second stage is what would be called sanctification or becoming a holy people unto our God. You see, first we're made innocent. God then takes the innocent and makes them holy. Now, how do you and I become holy? You don't make yourself holy and you don't make something else holy. God is the only one who can make something holy and God, God is holy. Holy and reverend is His name, we're told in Psalm 111. Holy and reverend is His name. God is holy. Where God places His presence is holy. The tabernacle, the holy of holies, why was that sacred? Because God placed His presence presence there. You know, the ground where Moses was was holy ground. Why? Because Moses was there? No. Because God was there. You remember the voice out of the burning bush said, Moses, take your shoes off the ground where you're standing is holy ground. God had placed His presence there. We become a holy people when God places His presence in us. Don't you remember what the Apostle Paul explained back in the book of 1 Corinthians? When he said in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Don't you realize you are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you? So our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. We become a holy people unto our God because the Spirit of God is dwelling in us. You know, there's a reason why we go through in baptism the order that we do. There's A person is baptized, and then after they're baptized, the laying on of hands for the receiving of God's Spirit. You see, God does not dwell in the midst of uncleanness. There's an interesting 
illustration of that that's given back in the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, let's see here. In Deuteronomy chapter 23. Now here is, God was giving certain laws in this, in, in one sense related to health, but there was a spiritual principle. God gave them instructions about sanitation and, and, and sewage. He told them in Deuteronomy 23, 12, you shall have a place also without the camp where you shall go forth abroad. You shall have a paddle upon your weapon, and it shall be with you. When you shall ease yourself abroad, you shall dig therewith and turn back and cover that which comes from you. For, notice verse 14, For the Lord your God walks in the midst of the camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore shall your camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in you and turn away from you. Well, see, God walked, as he said, through the midst of the camp. God instructed Israel they were to keep the camp clean. Now, yes, it was a matter of sanitation and hygiene and it prevented disease and it did a lot of things from a physical standpoint, but it also served to illustrate a very important spiritual lesson. If God would not dwell in the midst of physical uncleanness, if they couldn't, you know, he didn't want raw sewage running in the streets. God says, I'm not going to walk in the midst of that. If he wouldn't walk in the midst of it physically, how much less does God want to walk in the midst of it spiritually? You see, the first step is we have to become clean. That's why we're baptized. We're immersed, symbolic of washing away our sins. And we stand before God, clean, innocent. And he places his spirit in us to sanctify us, which means to set us apart. The word sanctify means to be set apart or dedicated for God. To be dedicated to God or to be set apart for God. Something that is made holy by for the presence of God. God sanctifies us through the indwelling of His Spirit. That is the second phase of salvation. That God... You see, we're told... Notice as we find here in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we are, baptized, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. We will be in the likeness of his resurrection. We are what? We are to walk in newness of life. We're to be led by the Spirit of God. God's Spirit is to dwell in us. God tells us in in the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and and, uh, uh, back here in uh, verse or chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6.16, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Eternal, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Bringing to culmination, bringing to maturity, bringing to full development holiness. Standing in awe and reverence of God. See, the second phase of salvation, first God makes us innocent, then he begins the process of making us holy. He makes us innocent when he empties us of guilt, but you know it's not enough just to be empty of guilt. You've got to be filled with the righteous character of God. Something doesn't just stay empty, does it? Either the old comes back or something new comes in and fills up and takes the place of the old. First, God empties us of the guilt. He empties us of the sin. Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin. But you see, the second phase of salvation is God starts to fill us with himself. 
to write his laws in our hearts and minds, to place his spirit within us, to impart to us his character and his nature. We become partakers of the divine nature, as Peter says. See, God starts to fill us with something. He empties us of sin and begins to fill us with righteousness. It's a process. That is the process of the Christian life. It takes our active cooperation. But God begins the process of making us like Him. First He makes us innocent. Then He begins the process of making us holy. And the culmination. You see, we are justified, we are sanctified, but then we are living in anticipation of what? Of being glorified with Him. That's the third phase of salvation. Once you are glorified, then you are on the God level. God fills us with His glory. We're glorified with Him. Isn't that what Paul tells us in Romans? See, Romans chapter 8. Let's go back and notice once again. See here, in uh, where we're we're told here, as he goes through this uh, process, and he talks about how in Romans chapter eight and verse eleven, that if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by that spirit that dwells in you, and. Uh, We're told in verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. That we will be also glorified together. You see, that's the point. Ultimately, we will be glorified with Him. The whole creation waits and groans, waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Jesus Christ is going to become what? He is going to become the firstborn, or he is the firstborn, of many brethren. That's what we're told over here in Romans 8.29. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's being sanctified, made holy. See, God determined ahead of time that his purpose was that we would become like Christ. We would have Christ living in us. We would become conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whom he did predestinate, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. See, ultimately, we are to be glorified. That's what the final phase of salvation is, entering into the glory of God, stepping into eternity in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, this mortal putting on immortality. That's what the fall festival season looks forward to. The return of Jesus Christ and our entering into glory. First, we must be made innocent. Second, we must be made holy. And finally, we must be glorified with him. We will step into eternity putting on the very glory of God. Now, God has a process that he is working out. He has something that he is accomplishing. He's called us for a purpose. We're here celebrating this second of the three festival seasons. The one that is the celebration of the first fruits harvest. It is also the celebration of the second phase of salvation. Our being made as a holy people unto our God. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1.4, He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children or unto the sonship by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. The praise of the glory of His grace that He, wherein He has made us accepted in the Beloved. So, notice what we have here. He's chosen us in Christ Before the world began, God had a plan. God knew where he was going before he ever started. 
And his purpose was that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See, if, if we're going to enter the family of God, we've got to be holy and we've got to be blameless. So God makes possible our innocence. Christ paid the penalty for us. But then begins the process of making us holy, of imparting his character, his nature to us. And that is a process of time. That's the Christian life. You see, as it comes on down... Notice verse 11, in whom we've also obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who has who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. God predetermined that there would be those who would be called first. Now, God did not predestine that some would be saved and some would be lost. What he predetermined was that he would call some as a first fruits and he would deal with others later. But it's not God's will that any should perish. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But God deals with each in his own time. And he wants us to be holy and without blame. So God wants us to be innocent and he wants us to be filled with his character. And we see that laid out. We, we're also to be the first fruits. We find in verse 13, it's in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God's Spirit seals us. You know, if you have an official document and, and it is sealed, uh, the, where a notary has to seal it, and you, in some documents, you know, you have to be able to seal the raised seal. It is sealed. What, what does that seal mean? A, a seal is there to authenticate genuineness. That is to guarantee that this is the genuine article. This is the real thing. It is authenticated by that seal. God's Spirit seals us. It authenticates us as the genuine article. You see, that's what seals us. That's what sets us apart. Kings uh, in ancient times... Uh, would often, there would be a, a wax that would be melted there on a document and they had a signet ring, a seal on a ring that they would press into that warm wax. And it would leave an impress, it would leave a seal that authenticated it as the genuine article and there was only one ring like that. It was authenticated. God seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. It authenticates us as the genuine article. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. God, you see, gives us a little bit of His Spirit. Ultimately, we will be changed and transformed into Spirit. But the Spirit that He places within us is the earnest of that inheritance. So, let's proceed on. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse, we'll pick it up in verse 9, talking of God who has saved us and called us unto, has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, God had a purpose. We have a holy calling. It's not according to our works. God didn't call you because you deserved it. He didn't look down and say, well, boy, that's just about the best fellow I ever did. See, I've got to call him. She sure deserves it. No, God called us according, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace. God chose us. It wasn't because we were smarter or better or prettier or nicer or uh, this or that than anyone else. It's according to his purpose and according to his grace because God chose that everything is mine and I'm going to start with you. I'm going to give you a chance to be part of the first fruits. See, our calling is a very precious thing. God looked down and purposefully called you and me. That's why we're told we must make our calling and election sure. Our calling is precious. It's not something to be treated lightly. You could go through Luke 14 and other places and read of those who treated their calling lightly and they had excuses as to why they couldn't respond and sooner or later others were called to take their place. 
God has called you and me because He wants us, but we have to respond to that call. Notice on over in 1 Peter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge. Elect according to the foreknowledge. It's reserved and it's waiting. For those who are kept by God's power through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, the time will come when that salvation will be made manifest. And we will ultimately receive the end, the, the direction toward which our faith is heading, as it says in verse 9, the, the end, the purpose toward which our faith is directed, which is the salvation of our lives. This is something that even the prophets inquired and searched diligently. So we are, therefore, verse 13, to gird up the loins of our mind, to be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ will be revealed in power and glory and we will be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as He which is called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conduct, because it is written, Be you holy, for I am holy. God has called us to be like Him. To be like Him. You know, that's an important thing, brethren. We come here and we assemble before God and we hear the sermons. We read the articles. How much do we walk away with? Is it just a way to spend a Saturday morning or a Saturday afternoon? Is it just an opportunity to come and see your friends and sort of talk and visit and it's nice and we sort of have the day off and we don't have to work? What difference does it make in your life and in mine? See, God has called us to become like Him. That's a process. And we can't do it on our own. We need His Spirit. But we have to be seeking it. We have to be seeking to apply what we hear and what we learn. He's holy. He's called us. We need to become holy in all aspects of our life. Be you holy for I am holy, God says. See, this is the second phase of salvation, of becoming holy, becoming like God, so that we will ultimately, at the return of Jesus Christ, be glorified with Him. We'll put on that glory. That's important to understand. What what sanctifies us? What sets us apart? What enables us to be set apart? We see earlier that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and sets us apart, makes us holy. Let's notice something else that ties in with that. John 17, 17, Jesus praying here the evening prior to his crucifixion. His prayer to the Father, he says in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them through your truth. We're set apart, we're made holy by the truth of God, by the word of God. You see, we're to live by what? What did Jesus say? Did he say, live by the words of the New Testament and forget about the old? I don't remember reading that one. But I'll tell you what I do remember reading back here in Matthew Let's just notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said. Was he just saying that for that moment? And then a few few months later he was going to change that. Man only needs to live by some of the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. Man only needs to live by, uh, you know, The New Testament, not the Old, or half the New Testament? Oh, it doesn't make any sense. We're sanctified, we're set apart by the by the truth of God, by the Word of God, that we're to live by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. We are to become like God. We're to search the Scriptures that we might understand the mind of God. And brethren, 
The Ten Commandments are the summary and ten basic points of the, of the fundamental law of God. That first and foremost is summed up by the one word love. God is love. Now, the first and great commandment is you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The second is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang everything else. See, the first four of the Ten Commandments tell you how to love God, and the last six tell you how to love your neighbor. But the Bible is filled with principles that build upon and expand the Ten Commandments. You see, it's not enough. Some people read the Bible the wrong way. They say, well, if you can't show me a verse that says, thou shalt not, then I'm going to do it. Well, you know, the Bible is filled with principles of telling you what pleases God and what doesn't. We need to search the Scriptures trying to understand what is the most pleasing to God in every aspect of our conduct. What is it that Christ would do if he were here? Because if Christ is living his life in us as men and women, what is it he would do? We search the Scriptures. You don't just use your imagination sort of thing. You search the Scriptures. Look at the examples. Look at the illustrations. Seek to apply the principles of God. That's how we grow. Understanding more fully. Let's notice on over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. So he says, I, I want you to become more and more like you have learned to be. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God's purpose, God's will for you is that you be holy, that you be set apart, dedicated to Him. Your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, he was dealing with a specific issue. There were some who were taking uh, immorality very lightly. The Greek and Roman world took immorality very lightly, just as much of our culture and society does today. And so Paul was telling them that they needed to know about how to go about obtaining a wife, verse 4, in sanctification and honor, not in lust, as the Gentiles that know not God. So he said, "You, God wants you to be holy. God wants your conduct to be holy. You need to know how to go about getting married, how to go about obtaining a wife, the right way, in a holy way, in an honorable way. Not in immorality and lust. He discussed that, that God has not called us, verse uh, 7, God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And if you take that lightly, if you despise that or reject that, then you're not rejecting or despising man, but God who has given unto us the Holy Spirit. So, what do we find here? God's will is our sanctification, our being set apart as His holy people. He wants us set apart and dedicated to Him. Know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God? You are not your own. Glorify God in your mortal body, we're told. Back in the book of Romans, chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we'll pick it up um, in verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members, the members of your body, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so, now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. He said, there was a way you used to live. And you let your body 
participate in a lot of things. You yielded the members of your body. You voluntarily participated in things that were unclean and that were wrong. So that's no good. Now you need to yield your members, the members of your body, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Now, how do you know what righteousness is? See, this is the problem that those who want to do away with the law get into. They say, well, you know, everybody be good, but what's good? Who defines what's good? Who tells you what's the difference between good and bad? You get into situation ethics, that you, you finally wind up with a situation you had at the end of the book of Judges, which was the bloodiest book in the whole Bible, and the last thing you read in the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Everybody was a law unto themselves. They just followed the way that seemed right to them. We live in a world that's filled with that sort of thing. People just follow the way that seems right to them. Well, the way I see it, you know, some people go out and, and uh, uh, commit abortions and, and, and uh, other people go out and blow away the ones that commit abortion. And they're both following the way that seems right to them. One of them thinks there's nothing wrong with abortion and the other one thinks there's nothing wrong with blowing somebody away that does things you don't think they ought to do. And so we find ourselves in an increasingly lawless society. People are a law unto themselves. You have to have a law. Law defines sin. Paul said that I wouldn't have known sin, I wouldn't have known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. Uh, that's what, uh, uh, you know, that's what, that, that's what he uh, brings out, you see, over here in Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 7. Is the law sin? God forbid. I would not have known sin, but by the law, I hadn't known lust, except the law said, you shall not covet. See, the law tells us what's right and wrong. Paul said, how would I know I shouldn't lust? But there's a commandment that says don't covet. And so that tells me I shouldn't. Now, knowing I shouldn't and not doing it, that's not the same thing. But you've got to start by knowing. If you don't know, you can't even try to do. You've got to know. And if you come to know, then you can try to do, to put it into practice to put it into action. So, here in Romans chapter 6 and verse uh, 19, as we read, that we're to yield our members, servants, to righteousness and unto holiness. Righteousness leading to holiness. Righteousness is defined by the commandments of God, the law of God, and it leads to holiness, to being dedicated to God and God's service. See, when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. We talk about being free. Well, what are you free from? Well, there was a time when we were free from righteousness. That's not a good thing to be free from. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you're now ashamed? The end of those things is death. You know, the old way of life. What, well, those are things that, uh, uh, that we would be ashamed of. And those are things that lead to death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end, everlasting life. You see, the result of, of holiness, the result of holiness, where holiness is to lead, is unto everlasting life. That is the end. That is the purpose. That is the goal toward which all the effort is directed, is to everlasting life. We're to have our fruit, the fruit of our lives. What is born and produced in our lives is to be holy. Holiness leads through to everlasting life. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. How do you arrive at salvation? Notice, you know, people, some people think they already have it. God has chosen us. He's chosen you. He's chosen me. He has chosen us from the beginning, chosen us what? To salvation 
What do you go through? Through sanctification of the Spirit, through being set apart and made holy by the indwelling of the Spirit of God and belief of the truth. Belief of the truth. You're to believe the truth. To hold fast to the truth. Through sanctification, through being set apart and made holy. And that is accomplished through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. That's why, you see, we read under the New Covenant that God will write His laws in our hearts and in our minds. How is that taking place? That's not taking an ink pen and sort of writing something, you know, they cut into you and took uh, with open heart surgery. They wouldn't find the Ten Commandments uh, written with an ink pen. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something being indelibly impressed into your thinking, into your, when it says your heart and mind, it's talking about your emotions and your, your logic, your reason. It's talking about accepting on the inside as a part of you God's laws. Now, how are God's laws written in our mind? Well, you know, we read them with our eyes. We have them read to us. We are told. We see in the scriptures God's law. Now, if we have the Spirit of God, if we're led by the Spirit of God, we are the sons of God. God's Spirit leads us how? It leads us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. So the pull of God's Spirit is going to be to do what you ought to do. God's Spirit is working with you. There's a pull. There's a tug. Now, you can overcome that tug. In fact, sometimes it's pretty easy to overcome that tug. You know, there's a little little pull. You shouldn't say that. shouldn't do that. And yet... You know, we've all at one time or another just sort of squelched that down and gone ahead and done it anyway. But you see, there's a tug there, there's a pull, and the more you time, you, when you spend time praying and studying, God's Spirit will begin to convict you. Things will come to mind that you said, that you did, and you think, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I, I wish I hadn't done that. And you go to God and you ask Him to forgive you, and the next opportunity that comes, you try to do it right. And you see, we began to develop the habit of righteousness, of doing it the right way. It begins to be more and more indelibly impressed as we follow the lead and the pull of God's Spirit. And God's laws began to be written in our hearts and in our minds. God has chosen us to salvation. We're ultimately to share life with Him in His family. We're going to reign on the earth as kings and priests. But brethren, if we're going to do that, it takes more than just being made in us. We've got to become holy. We've got to have God's character impressed in us. That's why it's necessary that we overcome. See, there's a purpose. God's plan has a purpose. God is accomplishing something in your life and in mine. It's not a game. It's not something to be played with. It's not just a place to come and, and see friends. There's a way of life that we're trying to learn that we're to put into practice. With God's help, we can't do it on our own strength. But as we learn it and as we seek to follow that way. Notice in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 verse 12. Speaking of Christ, well, let's notice, uh, let's go back to verse 10. We're, by which will we're sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. See, we're, it's possible that we can be made holy because Christ died for us. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected, he has brought to fullness forever them that are sanctified. You see, we don't need continual offering. One offering was enough to bring to completion those who are set apart as holy to God. Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us, for after that he says before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. To come in 
having this boldness. But God is writing our, His laws in our hearts and in our minds. See, that's what sanctification involves. It involves developing the character of God through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Let's notice back in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. You who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now is he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. There was a time we were cut off from God. We were enemies in our mind. We weren't tuned in on God's wavelength. We didn't hold God's values. We were not oriented toward serving God and toward obeying God. We were attracted to the value system of the world, which is called in 1 John 2, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We were enemies. You can't be, James says, you know, you can't be friends of the world and, 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 uh, and friends of God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, James tells us. So you can't fit in with the devil's world and fit in with God at the same time. The world has a different set of values. And it's based on lust and it's based on greed and it's based on vanity and it's based on jealousy. No, there was a time when we were alienated from God, but now we've been reconciled, we've been brought into harmony, and the body of His flesh, Jesus Christ, died to reconcile us. His purpose is to present us holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereby Paul and made a minister. We have to continue in the faith. We have to continue to serve God. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, not gone off on tangents here, there, or yonder. So he comes on down here in verse 26. And he says, Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. What is this mystery? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. That Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit of God, can live His life in you and me. That is our hope of glory. First, He has died to make possible our reconciliation, to make possible our being moved from guilty to innocent. Now, He lives in us through the indwelling of the Spirit. See, this is the point. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As we develop the character in the mind of God, we might ultimately be glorified with Christ. Heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Born into the very family of God at the resurrection. A great and glorious call. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. He's the firstborn from the dead. Notice what we're told in Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 9. This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So love is to lead somewhere. We're to grow in knowledge and in judgment. See, the love of God is to lead us places. Your love will abound, take you into knowledge, take you into judgment, being able to choose. See, judgment has to do with the application of knowledge. Love has to do with the orientation of our heart and mind. We love God. We want His way. That leads to knowledge. If you really love God's ways, if you want God's ways, if you love God, you want to be like God. So that will lead you to knowledge of studying God's Word to find out what are God's ways. If I really love God and I want to please Him, then I start trying to gain knowledge to find out how to be pleasing to God. I want to know. If I really want to be like God, then I'm going to study His Word to try to find out what pleases God and what displeases God. So I grow in knowledge. I begin to learn and to understand that God likes this. He doesn't like that to knowledge, and then that leads into judgment, which is making choices. I don't learn knowledge just as an academic thing that I can recite off lists of commandments and do, lists of do's and don'ts. The purpose of knowledge is just, is just not to acquire the ability to quote Scripture and, and be able to impress other people as to how much you know. See, knowledge is to be applied. 
Knowledge is to lead to judgment. Love leads to, love is to lead us into knowledge and knowledge is to bring us to judgment. The ability to make choices. If I have knowledge of God's will, then I need to put it into practice in my life and, and judgment is every time you make a choice. You decide to do this, not do that, gonna start doing this, gonna stop doing that. Every time you make a choice, you are making a judgment. That's what the word judgment means. It means to choose. Now, hopefully, our choices will be based on knowledge and not on ignorance. And if we really love God, then we want to learn how to be like God. We want to learn how to please God. And we will seek, as we learn those things, to make choices to put it into practice. So he says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Verse 10, that you may approve things that are excellent. Or that you may learn to choose the best. You may learn to choose the best. You know, it's not just a matter of trying to just get by. Some people uh, like to, to hug the yellow line. They like the gray areas. God says, I want you to learn to choose the best. We don't want to be like the fella, you know, that uh, as I uh, remember years ago, and this has been probably close to 20 years ago at the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, I was uh, dealing with counseling and anointing. I had a man that came in, I wanted to counsel, and, and the beginning of his question, I, I'll never forget the first few words of his question, he, he started off, he said, what I want to know is if, w- will I get put out of the church if, and then he started into what he had in mind to do. And uh, basically it was, uh, he had in mind, uh, he, he uh, was going to trade the old model in on a new model, and I'm not talking about cars. Uh, and uh, I told him he asked the wrong question. It was the wrong question. You know, it was, it was as though his ultimate source of security, if somebody said, look, you can sit in church and nobody will do anything, well, great. Oh, well, that's fine. That's all I wanted to know. That's the wrong thing to, that's the wrong thing to want to know. You think just sitting in a chair somewhere is, is, that's the ultimate, that's your ultimate goal? You want to sit in a chair here until you die? Well, I hope our goal is to be in the kingdom of God. You see, the question we need to ask is what does God want me to do? What's God's will? What's God's purpose? What does God say? What does God want? Oh, you may do any number of things and, quote, get by with it in the sense that nobody notices or nobody knows or nobody, quote, does anything to you. Big deal. Big deal. You put something over on me, you haven't done anything that any number of other people haven't done. Every now and then I find out things my kids did that uh, I didn't know about. You know, things they did that put things over on me 15 years ago or whatever. Uh, maybe 15 years from now I'll find out what they're doing now. But uh, uh, anyway, sometimes you think you know and you don't always. But... Uh, the point is, if you put something over on me, or somebody put something over on you, see, we've all had people put things over on us, and we will as long as we're in the flesh. But the goal, the purpose is not to see if you can somehow impress people. It doesn't matter if I convince every one of you. Ultimately, it's God that is my judge and yours. See, ultimately, we all have to stand before God. And, and that's the point. See, he says here that you might learn to choose the best. To approve things that are excellent. To choose the best. Go for the best. Don't try to skirt by. Don't try to say, well, I wonder if, I wonder, I don't think God told me in the like a fire for this. Well, I'll go ahead and do it. Hope that he won't. What we're trying to learn to do is to choose the best. What's the best? What would God really want me to do? What's the, what is the thing that God would be, would be most pleased with? What is the choice that Jesus Christ would make? That's the choice Christ in me would make. See, that's what we need to be aiming for. You're not always going to hit it, but if you're aiming for it, you're going to be heading in that direction. But you might learn to choose the best. That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus unto the glory and praise of God. You see, we'll be bearing fruits in our lives, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of righteousness, 
That's by Jesus Christ living his life in us and through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, unto the glory and praise of God. That's our ultimate destiny, is to be glorified with him. We're to share with the Father and with Christ the glory that they shared with one another before the world began. You realize that? That, you know, that, that, that seems too far out for a lot of people. But that's what Christ said. He said in John 17, 15, Father, glorify me. Glorify you me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Christ asked the Father as he was preparing to be crucified to restore to him the glory that they shared together before the world was. And then he talked about the fact that ultimately the glory which the Father gave him, he was giving to us that we might all be one. He talked about that in verse 22 of John 17. So let's go here to one final scripture back in Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Let's uh, notice in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, there is a family. And what is it called? Well, what is the name of the family? It's the God family. That's what it says. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The family takes its name from the Father. So are we going to be a part of the family of God? That's what it says. Paul says, I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. See, the source of our strength is the Spirit of God dwelling in us, the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, which is what? What is the culmination of it all? That you might be filled with all the fullness of God that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The family of God. The family in heaven and in earth that takes its name from the Father. The whole family is named. We might be strengthened with the Spirit in the inner man. Christ dwelling in us. We could really grasp the enormity, the full magnitude and size and scope of what God has in store for us, which is that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Brethren, can we grasp what God has in store for us? We're here today celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of the First Fruits Harvest, that celebrates the calling of the first fruits that celebrates the second phase of salvation, our being set apart as a holy people through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that we might develop the very character and nature of God so that ultimately at the resurrection we might be filled with all the fullness of God. We might share in the same glory that Christ and the Father shared in before the world was. Brethren, if we really grasp our calling, what it means to be a part of the first fruits, to have a part in God's plan and His purpose and His work, if we really grasp our calling, we will never treat it cheaply, we will never treat it carelessly. We will never let it slip. We will recognize that our calling to ultimately be filled with all the fullness of God is the most precious thing that there could ever be. And we will never, ever let anything stand in the way of our making, our calling, and election.